Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Phillips, and welcome to Zero Spin's first book club. The goal of these uh, book club meetings is to go into uh, some topics on Zero Spin, analyze them, and go through them. I actually put a little PowerPoint uh, presentation together to make it simple. And the topic of today's talk is multiple sclerosis. You know, MS has been around forever. It's an inflammatory condition that affects the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord and the eyes. And people get numbness and weakness and loss of vision. And it's a terrible and it's a common illness. And I want to discuss the possible infectious causes of MS and take a, a hard look at how well the standard therapies work or don't work, as the case may be. So I'm going to load this PowerPoint presentation here. And then we'll just start, if that's okay. So the title is The Infection Connection. Great formatting there. Let's see that it's not so good. But, um, and I took down the paywalls of parts one and two of Zero Spin. So I hope everybody can follow along. So there's two general types of multiple sclerosis. is relapse or emitting, which constitutes the majority of cases, about 85%. And then there's primary progressive MS. And relapsing remitting MS, a subset of those cases is called benign MS because they never really progress. At least they don't progress over at least 15 years. So even without any treatments, these people do well and they don't develop disability. And that's about 5 to 10% of MS cases. And the rest of them worsen over time. You know, relapsing and remitting MS comes and goes, hence the name. But over time, about 90 to 95% of them get worse and worse without treatments and do result in increased disability. Some people will convert to what's called secondary progressive MS. And with secondary progressive M MS, sometimes there continue to be attacks and sometimes there don't. Sometimes it's just a steady decline, which is comparable to primary progressive MS. And weirdly enough, primary progressive MS, even though it causes more disability and is far harder to treat, is associated with less brain lesions. It's almost like a bit of a different animal. And I'm just trying to get the hang of this. This is my first time. So it looks like the streaming service doesn't support um, PowerPoint in the way that I would like it to. But anyway, it is what it is. The uh, formatting is a bit off. So I'd like to talk about, uh, there's been a few epidemics of MS that have been well documented in the medical literature. Probably the most famous one of them is called the Faroe Island epidemics. And they never had MS in the Faroe Islands before 1943. And it sprung up almost overnight and it happened in recurring epidemic waves. And when people uh, evaluated the epidemiology of this, I mean, of course it can't be genetic, the genetics of these people didn't change overnight. And they realized that the British occupied the Faroe Islands. And a lot of them were from the Scottish Highlands where MS was common. And they lived there between 1940 and 1945. So the rates of MS peaked in around 1945. And then they kind of went down a little bit. And then they kind of increased over time. And now in the Faroe Islands, they're... And they, the rates are similar to the rest of Europe, and it's just endemic there. It has a, a foothold, and it didn't go away. And when they analyzed the epidemiology of this, they said, wow, this really looks like an infection, an infection that uh, is widespread, but asymptomatic in most people. So in 2021, Physicians Weekly ran this headline that MS disease-modifying therapy shows reduced disability accrual over 15 years. So it was a very big, kind of famous study. There were 59 authors, the biggest MS specialists, arguably in the world, published in a major medical journal, Neurology. And they looked at MS patients over 15 years to see how well the MS treatments did. And I just want to take a look at that. So, so the authors write that the main goal of treatment is to prevent long-term disability accrual. And the study's result show that continued treatment with MS immunotherapies reduces this by 19 to 44%. But for those of you who may not have taken statistics classes or don't remember it, that confidence interval over there goes from 1% to 62%. 
So that means that based on the statistics of this study, we're confident that the reduction in disability is anywhere from a 1% reduction in disability to a 62% reduction in disability. And when confidence intervals include a zero, it means that the possible reduction in disability doesn't exist. If confidence intervals include a negative number, it means that it's possible that the result that you're hoping for, you could be having the, the exact opposite of that result included in there. So you'll see that it's barely statistically significant. This falls very, very close to the zero. It lands at 1%. And in when you have findings where there's controversial nature to the findings, something like this would have brought a, a big uproar. So for example, they did three randomized control trials looking at antibiotic treatment for chronic Lyme. And one of the trials didn't show benefits and stopped early. And the other two trials showed benefits. And one of them showed benefits to cognitive functioning and body pain and fatigue. And the other trial just showed benefits to fatigue. And the medical community was up in arms and said that these aren't real benefits because they weren't sustained and the people got worse when they um, were off antibiotics for a longer period of time. And, but there was good statistical benefit there. And here in this study, there's barely statistical benefit. And I don't want to further analyze that. So the authors omitted a subset of patients that had benign MS. And benign MS can only be diagnosed after it's been observed for 15 years. So you couldn't admit these people at the beginning of the study because you wouldn't know, you know, have a crystal ball, who's going to have benign MS and who's have really serious MS. So the goal of the study was to follow people over time and to see how they respond to MS treatments. And then I just found it so curious that a significant subset of these patients were admitted after the fact. And these are patients who ordinarily would you know, not get worse over time, hence the, the label benign MS. So these people wouldn't benefit from treatment and without treatment, they wouldn't get worse. So admitting them, this untreated group that didn't worsen would kind of favor treatment. So the thing I have that against this, or the problem I have with this is twofold. One's, one is that the, the point of the study is to follow people over time and see how they do. And then a group was selectively omitted after the fact. The other issue that I have with this is that what about the people that had the most severe cases of MS? Here you're looking at one extreme, the people who had non-progressive MS, this benign MS, and they are kind of skewed not to benefit from treatment because they wouldn't have gotten worse anyway. What about the treatment of the people who have the most severe cases of MS? They were not excluded from the study. So to counterbalance this emission on the very mild end, I could see if they omitted the most severe end because the people with the most severe disease, if they were not to be treated, it favors a larger difference between the treatment and the non-treatment. I hope that was clear. So you have to wonder how would the results of this study have been different if this group was not admitted after the fact. And I think that it may not have shown statistical significance at all because it was so close to the borderline before the submission. The other problem that I have with this study, I'm kind of amused by the different colors and what this formatting is doing, but there's primary progressive, like I said before, and secondary progressive MS they evaluated secondary and primary progressive MS together. So they evaluated the outcomes together. And everybody knows that we don't really have good treatments for primary progressive MS. There's only one treatment, it's called Ocrevus. And secondary progressive MS, we have lots of FDA approved treatments and we really, know, we really need to know how well they work or how well they don't work. By combining these two groups together, you could be obscuring the data about how secondary pro progressive MS responds or doesn't respond to standard MS treatments. So there were, again, 59 authors in this study. And I would think that many of them would realize that the data would become non-usable if they combined the outcomes from secondary and primary progressive MS in one group instead of evaluating them separately. 
and that's what was done. I don't see the wisdom in it, and I find it troubling. So next slide. They also included this math. And just a dirty little secret about doctors that I've come in contact with. Uh, it's not all doctors. Some doctors are great. But when I went to um, undergraduate school, I went to, um, went to Penn, and I went to the Wharton School undergrad. It's a business school. And I was surrounded by, you know, well-rounded, smart people. I expected the same thing to be in med school. I went to SUNY Syracuse. And when I was there, I found that there was some smart people and there were some uh, people who were very, very motivated to be doctors that their family put pressure on them and had self-esteem problems. They studied all the time and they weren't particularly gifted and they had brittle personalities and insecure. And that was what I noticed. And then I, I was kind of chilled by the fact that these people are going to grow up to be doctors, you know? And so what I'm trying to say is I don't think doctors want to admit when they're, they don't understand something. I don't understand this math. I didn't, I didn't try to understand it. I think it's overly complex and I think it's trying to, to be kind of saying, you know, look at us. We're so fancy. We put this big math uh, equation in here and I just, I'm disturbed by that because I don't think any doctor that's reading this article is going to do this math. And I don't know. I just think it's, I think it's pretentious. So here's the financial disclosures in this paper. I had to put it in small font because there's quite a lot. And again, the formatting of this uh, slide probably cut it off a little bit. But at the end of it, it says go to neurology.org forward slash n for the full disclosures, implying that this is just a partial list. And there's so many that had to um, really, I think, truncate this. So physicians at Memorial Sloan Kettering wrote this about industry-sponsored research. And it said they looked at 36 studies. And it said that the results were unanimous. All 36 studies showed that receiving industry money increases prescribing. This was consistent across all medical specialties and types of drugs. Industry money affects how doctors prescribe cholesterol medicines. It affects drugs for Alzheimer's disease, for multiple sclerosis, and for blood thinners. Even affects which drugs drugs are used to treat cancer. And perhaps most worrisome, it increases how many opioids doctors prescribe. The arguments in favor of industry payments no longer have traction in light of current evidence. Accepting industry money can no longer be rationalized as beneficial or even permissible. And blah, blah, blah. So we have multiple studies showing that doctors who receive industry payments, their judgment is influenced by those industry payments. And I just wanted to point that out as we go along. So here, I want to talk about a potential spirochetal relationship to multiple sclerosis. There's a lot of infectious relationships to MS, and I'll focus on just a couple here. But um, spirochetes are something that I know fairly well. It's uh, where the focus of my practice has been for a long time because I see a lot of patients with vector-borne illnesses, things like Lyme disease and others. And Lida Matman, actually, who was one of my mentors when I was younger, she, I met her when she was 86 years old. I met her at a medical conference, and she was one of the smartest people I'd ever met at that advanced age. And I worked with her until she was in her 90s. And she was on faculty of major teaching hospitals um, in the 1950s when there were no women in science. She was a super powerhouse. And she said that, a spiral-shaped organism has been noted in multiple sclerosis by so many investigators over so many decades in so many countries that it can hardly be ignored. Great quote. So in 1913, researchers first documented transmission of neurologic illness from MS patients' tissues like brain and spinal cord to animals via injection. And spirochetes were found repeatedly in the brains and tissues of MS patients and in the animals into which these tissues were injected. And many replicated these findings and many could not. And interestingly enough, only some animals got sick. So I wanna delve into that, like the whys in the house. So these are images from one of the uh, 
really well-known works. I'm looking at spirochetes in the brains of MS patients. This is from a, a Dr. Steiner from a long time ago. It was 1950s. And these are silver stains. And again, with this formatter. So spirochetes as a class of bacteria are very, very hard to grow from animals and people who have these infections. It's kind of like one of the, the banes of everybody's existence. So syphilis, they had been trying for decades and decades and decades to grow syphilis from patients with syphilis. And Lyme has been incredibly difficult to isolate from patients with Lyme. It's just the one of the nature of the beast. And for 40 years, they could not isolate these spirochetes alive from MS patients. And then in 1957, they published an article, what they did. And they grew spirochetes from MS patients' spinal fluid. And it was reproduced by several researchers, including Stanford University microbiologists. But some researchers, again, failed to replicate these findings. And among the most influential was an, hour, an article by a Dr. Kurtz, who I'll go into in a second. So I want to look at like this puzzle of why some animals um, got infected when they got uh, injected with MS tissues and why some animals didn't. And was it because sometimes only infectious organisms were present in some injections and not in others? And why did the illness range from mild to deadly? And, and then did some animals develop asymptomatic infections? So all these questions, this is a huge range of, uh, of how the animals got sick or didn't get sick. Again, apologies for this formatting. So when we look at spiracular illnesses in general, it makes a big difference at what stage they're in, in terms of their infectivity. So spirochetes found in animals inoculated uh, with MS patients' tissues, they were found in, when they were inoculated from, um, what should you call it, from MS patients who had early disease, but not MS patients who had late disease. You say, why is that important? because the same thing happens with syphilis. So in late stage syphilis, they have less of these spiral forms and they have more of these granular forms. So spiral, for, spiral forms are the typical or stereotypical spiral shaped organism of spirochetes. And then these granular forms are little round things. And syphilis granular forms aren't infectious to rabbits, but spiral forms are. So there is a difference between the infectivity of the spiral forms and the infectivity of the granular forms. And in untreated human syphilis, it gets progressively less contagious as the stages continue. So primary syphilis is the most contagious. Secondary syphilis is still contagious. And tertiary syphilis is not contagious. So, so looking at this spirochetal culture puzzle, this Kurtz study where they couldn't replicate the um, findings of these other people who did replicate Ickelson's, if I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, initial work, where they found spirochetes growing from spinal fluid. In the Kurtz study, they did spinal fluid cultures of MS versus controls, and the work was done in two labs. One was in Pittsburgh and one was in Philadelphia. And in Pittsburgh, they had no positive cultures, and in Philadelphia, they had lots of positive cultures. By the way, I'd be suspicious. Why were there no positive cultures in one lab and lots of positive cultures in the other lab? They didn't really comment. The um, Philadelphia lab found culture evidence of spinal flu from MS patients three times more frequently than from healthy controls. But it was ignored. And the reason it was ignored is because the rate was similar to cultures from patients with other non-MS neurologic diseases. So they had healthy controls compared to them. They had this really large increase in culture positivity compared it to other neurologic diseases, which were varied, and there wasn't an increased rate. They cultured and isolated just as many spirochetes from the other neurologic diseases. The thing with Lyme, though, now is that the original... Steiner data, those pictures of spirochetes that I showed um, back a few slides ago, he was able to determine that the class, the family of these organisms, the family of these spirochetes were not the same class as syphilis, it was the same class as Lyme. 
which is a Borrelia. And Borrelia, Lyme bacteria, are known to cause a whole range of neurologic illnesses from peripheral neuropathy to cognitive decline to problems with coordination and weakness and things that look like MS and things that look like other neurologic conditions. You know, lots of patients with Lyme can develop migrainous events, migraine. So to use these not healthy other neurologic patients as controls may have been not the greatest idea because who knows what they had. And then spiroketal culture puzzle number two and again, this Dr. Kurtz was very, very influential. So when they he, they weren't able to to um, to replicate, you know, Ickelson's work, it really was a big blow to having people believe them. But so Kurtz and his team used pooled human serum. What does that mean? So sterilized human serum, which is um, a part of the blood, has been used to culture, um, you know, difficult to culture bacteria like spirochetes. And the problem is that serum has antibodies against infections that we've encountered in our lives. And obviously, when you have a pooled serum product, it's from more people, and it's going to have a higher chance of having antibodies against infection X, Y, or Z. So when using serum to culture syphilis bacteria, and they had known this at this time, they only use serum from patients test negative for syphilis because antibodies will impair the growth of the syphilis bacteria. But they didn't really, you know, it wasn't widespread. They just came out with an antibody test for this bacteria that they found. They called it Spirochela myelothora, means myelin destroyer, I believe, in Latin. And they found that 26% of people who are healthy had evidence that they're harboring this bacteria. And, you know, in this pooled serum product, they didn't screen people for antibody positivity against Spirochela myelothora, which is a my left flora, which is a, um, a Borrelia. So what I'm saying is it's possible, certainly and probable actually, that if you have a pooled serum product that it's gonna contain antibodies against this organism. So that's an issue there. And here I'd like to talk about the relationship of Epstein-Barr and multiple sclerosis. And they came out with, it was like big news a couple years ago that they found that when people got Epstein-Barr in the military, they had a 32 times increased rate of getting MS after Epstein-Barr. And people in the military are typically adolescents and young adults. When adolescents and young adults get Epstein-Barr, they get mono. And when, mono, when Epstein-Barr infection happens in toddlers and young kids, it's usually a cold, not mono. So it turns out that in developed countries, because we have better hygiene, we don't get Epstein-Barr until later on. And kids get it during kissing, you know, when they're adolescents and young adults, and that's why it's delayed. So the rates of MS in developed countries are between 20 and 40 times higher than in developing countries. And in developing countries where the hygiene is maybe a little bit less good, the people get Epstein-Barr early on in early childhood. They get a little cold, they don't get mono, and there's actually not an increased risk of MS associated with that. So when they made these conclusions that Epstein-Barr causes MS, it's kind of like half, right? So other people have looked at this way before this article had even come out. And because the data is not really new data, it's just repackaged. And they said that infection alone is clearly insufficient to cause MS, again, referring to Epstein-Barr, that age of primary infection and the host's immunological response may be modifiers of the Epstein-Barr associated risk for MS. Accordingly, infectious mononucleosis, meaning mono, usually caused by EBV in adolescence, has been associated with increased risk of MS. So it's not just having Epstein-Barr, it's having Epstein-Barr in late teens, early 20s, getting mono is the risk for multiple sclerosis. So I include this slide, this is actually a direct quote from Zero Spin, that many chronic infections underlie and cause a range of chronic illnesses and the data supporting this for multiple sclerosis is compelling. And this slide doesn't speak toward things like spirochetes. Like I said, there's a lot of infections that um, are contributing to uh, what we see as multiple sclerosis. I do think that spirochetes are a big, big player, but I don't think they're the only player. And I think, like I said, there's very powerful cofactors, Epstein-Barr being one of them. 
And then also, what about coronaviruses? So they found coronaviruses in the brains of patients way before COVID was even COVID. They had found and had data finding coronavirus uh, pieces and bits in the, the plaques of MS patients. And I wouldn't go so far as to say that coronaviruses definitively cause MS. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, is this another cofactor similar to Epstein-Barr? Or in some cases, is it the main driver? I'm not sure. I can analogize this to studies of toxoplasmosis. Toxo is a um, parasitic infection. It's very common. It's something like 10% of the United States population has toxo. And it's routinely ignored by infectious disease doctors. And should it be? So a meta-analysis of nine studies of toxo, um, nine studies of looking at toxo antibody positivity and looking at over 4,000 patients shows that the rates of the risk of having rheumatoid arthritis when people test positive for toxoplasmosis is 330% of people who test negative for, for toxoplasmosis. So it's tempting to think that toxo is the main driver of rheumatoid arthritis. And maybe it is, or maybe it's not. Parasites and infections like bacteria have complex interrelationships. For example, um, Babesia and Lyme, if you put them in the same mouse, the mouse is more Lyme when there's Babesia on board. And Babesia is a parasite, which is immune suppressive. Toxo is also a parasite, also immune suppressive. And when they do these studies and they just infect the mouse with one infection, it's not, it's not real life. You know, the mouse is running through the field and gets nine different bacterial infections and 12 viruses and whatever. And how they interact with each other is not really represented in most studies. So I'm just uh, putting that something to think about. And the reason is because I have a lot of experience looking for infections in MS patients over decades. And before COVID came along, we had a much better um, rates of out good outcomes. We still have decent outcomes. We still get a lot of patients better. But in terms of radiographic improvement on, on brain lesions, so when we had found... Um, Patients with evidence of, of uh, spirochetes um, like Lyme or Borrelia miyamotoi, we would often see improvements, not just in, in uh, neurologic status, but also improvements radiographically. So the improvements clinically were in relapse and remitting MS patients. We didn't really um, have good results with primary progressive MS patients. I don't know that anyone really has. Um, but in relapse and remitting MS patients, our rates of clinical improvement were over 90%, and the radiographic improvement was about 50%. And now I'm seeing some disturbing cases where even though patients are clinically improving, the, the, um, the, the brain and spinal cord lesions are progressing. And I'm not sure how COVID is playing a role in this, but I suspect that, that it is. And so I'm going to try to open this up to questions if there are any exit full screen oh here we go so um let's see here states ms the line was used to cut from parasites well, let me put this one up i'll show different questions as we go along we'll see every doctor in youtube states ms and line was used to cut from parasites well lime is technically from a bacteria although you know spirochetes are weird bacteria spirochetes are in the 50s or so, they used to classify them as a different entity entirely. They didn't uh, classify them as bacteria or parasites, something in between. So like the relative size of red blood cell, lengthwise, let's say, is this big. And then Lyme, when it's in a spiral form, is like that big. So it doesn't look like a bacteria. It looks size-wise, it looks like a parasite, but it has ribosomes that are bacterial. So it's a, it's a weird organism. And then they just lumped it into the bacteria um, category. I think they just got lazy. So I don't know how to do anything here. So, um, okay. So what do you recommend I take my daughter for medical help to do? I'm so, I'm so sorry that uh, your daughter's not uh, doing well. I can't make official recommendations about anyone that I haven't seen on here. I just wanted to pop your question out and say how sorry I am to hear this, but um, there's, uh, there's lots of sources of information. It's almost like there's, you know, too much. It's like a menu, you know, like a diner. You know, I know the internet is confusing and everybody has something different to say. 
Um, I can only present my personal experiences and what I've seen in my patients and what I've done with the research to, you know, write chronic and to do um, talks on MS at different places, including um, large universities and stuff. So, um, okay. Okay, here's a good question, actually. I'm gonna do a, um, a talk on this coming up soon. It says, what's your opinion on why chronic Lyme and long COVID are the same exact symptoms? Yeah, they're like 95% they overlap. So I've talked about this publicly on videos in different uh, areas already, but um, I'm gonna do a, a deep dive on it uh, as the next one. The I think there's a big relationship. So um, I guess I'll speak personally, I'll speak professionally, I'll speak the whole way. So I got what I think is COVID January, 2020. It was obviously the first wave. They didn't know about COVID. I was sick as anything for months. And the last three years, most people know that I've had a, a life-changing experience with Bartonella and I was disabled from it. I walked for two years, the whole thing. Um, and I gotten markedly, markedly better. I like really got my life back and uh, owing to really powerful antimicrobial treatments and a lot of other things. But when I got COVID January 2020, I really haven't been the same since. It's not like I'm, you know, crying the blues or anything, but I um, have been significantly uh, relapsed. And I attributed it at first, like, to the, the death of my brother because it was such a horrible, horrible thing to go through. And then death of my father and just really the stress of going through, you know, just being locked down and everything else. But... That was my own personal experience. And then with my patients, I had my first patient who had a, a case of Bartonella that was reasonably well controlled. And she only had like little tingles um, throughout her body. And she got uh, COVID, a relatively mild case. And her illness changed from little tingles to searing neuropathic nerve pain to the point that she couldn't take two steps. And she was in the emergency room, I don't know, like 10 times in 30 days. And it, it, at the time, there wasn't much to treat with. It was during the first wave. And I treated her with all the options that we had at the time. And nothing was working for this new entity that people are calling long COVID. And I said, you know, your um, Bartonella symptoms have, you know, it's like two sides of the coin. There's tingles and numbness and pain. It's just like hot and cold neurologically are two sides of the same coin. And um, I was like, I think maybe we should treat Bartonella more more intensively. And I ended up giving her back to him. And these symptoms that we attributed to long COVID just exploded. And and to make a, a long story short, she got really, really much, much better. And you have to think, if that can happen to somebody with a known case of Bartonella, what happens to people who don't know they have anything? So the thing that's hardest to believe about these infections that's the most well-documented out of everything. And nobody disagrees about this. Even the IDSA agrees. IDSA is Infectious Disease Society of America. Everybody agrees that the uh, rates of asymptomatic infection vastly outnumber the rates of symptomatic infection for these illnesses. So what happens if somebody's asymptomatically infected, gets COVID, and their immune system gets dysregulated? And that's why I think that the symptoms of chronic Lyme and long COVID are almost exactly the same because I think they are related. I think the long COVID patients are getting marginalized and dismissed in the same way the chronic Lyme patients have gotten is because they are related illnesses. Again, not saying it's all Lyme, not saying it's all Bartonella, not saying it's all the viral part too. You have to think like when the virus persists in the body for a while and causes havoc, in what way does it cause havoc? immune dysregulation is one big thing and clotting is the other. So anyway, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, put that off. Has anyone reversed MS completely? We've had lots and lots of patients over the years who um, were fully disabled from MS, who became fully non-disabled and back at work and not in wheelchairs and things like this. So completely, I mean, I think these patients, um, often, well, almost almost universally require retreatments. You know, one of the patients in the book, actually, in Chronic, um, talked about one of my patients I know really well, who did phenomenally well. She was like one of these, you know, patients, I wish every MS patient was like her because um, she responded so beautifully to antimicrobials and, and so completely. And then turns out, not a great story, that um, she relapsed. And a lot of people go through this when the illness is coming back, when you've been off antibiotics for a long time, you just want it, you want it to be gone. You know, and it's like, just 
not even go back there, not open that door again. And she ignored symptoms, neurologic symptoms, getting worse for years, years and years. And she came back, she came back, back to see me um, pretty recently, about a year and a half ago. And and she's responded and stuff, but she already has um, uh, some damage on her MRI that I can tell is not going to be fixable. So once a certain amount of damage happens, it's not fixable by anything that we have currently available. And um, but before this kind of permanent damage occurs on MRI findings, a lot of things are fixable. And that's again with relapse and remitting, not to give anybody with primary progressive MS any type of false hope because um, the outcomes in the office are maybe 15% we can get better and 85% really haven't been able to. There's a lot more kind of like neurodegenerative overlays with uh, primary progressive MS. It's really mm -hmm. like I said, a different animal. And, uh, and again, not to be optimistic because most people don't describe me as an optimist. The, um, my patients do much better, but like I said, things have changed since COVID. It's not as good as it was. Um, so, oh, there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of things here into all those doctors. And okay. Well, thank you very much for this one. We have, um, so, okay. Has anyone ever seen those completely? Okay, Dr. S, can you speak to how Lyme spirochetes can cause hearing loss? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have seen um, uh, over the years, um, I get patients' histories and they'll say, you know, I, I was um, sick with two years uh, for mysterious symptoms that would come and go and body aches and fatigue and cognitive problems and sleep problems and um i woke up deaf one day and they never come back and that's horrible when that happens and I have not been able to get those patients hearing back however so that's called sudden sensory neural hearing loss and that's one extreme the other extreme how sometimes infection can cause hearing loss is a slow kind of uh, steady kind of a thing and those patients, I have gotten uh, quite a number of their, their, um, their hearing losses re resolved. But the other thing I want to say is uh, the patients that have been under my care who have woken up deaf, who have gotten um, acute sens sudden sensory neural hearing loss, all those patients we've gotten back. And you say, well, big deal. Well, the standard treatment for that, which I would never tell people not to take, most people that kind of follow me know that steroids can be contraindicated for infections because, you know, they lower the immune response and blah, blah, blah. But steroids are the standard treatment for acute sensory neural hearing loss, and they're given within 24 hours, and the outcomes are only about 50-50. And so if I have a patient who has acute sensory neural hearing loss and wake up, wakes up deaf, I would never tell them not to take steroids. You know, I would do every standard therapy and we should also throw in a bunch of antimicrobials in there too. And it's not even part of chronic because my story was too complicated to fit in a chapter. My story was edited down like 10 times. It's really a book, you know, I had a very complex illness and I had woken up, um, not completely deaf, but I think the worst time it was like 80% hearing loss in my left ear. And I'd gone to the ENT doctor emergency. I had gotten steroids. I was going to fill the steroids. I was going to take them. And my hearing started coming back. And I just held off a little bit more, a little more, and then it came back fully. But I've had about four or so episodes more of hearing loss that were partial, maybe not as dramatic as 80%. It's absolutely terrifying, you know, what happens. And uh, I think the mechanism is I think it's migrainous, but I'm not sure. I don't think it's a clotting mechanism. You know, none of those patients that have had these things have um, had uh, strokes or anything like this or mini strokes or any evidence of that type of thing. So I think that is the mechanism. And, um, and thank you for that question. And okay, so will your PowerPoint be available to view later? Yeah, I'm, let me think about how I can well, it'll be, uh, this is going to be, I'm sorry that you're not feeling well also, that you can't focus right now, but um, this will be available, you know, taped on the YouTube channel, certainly, and I don't know much about, you know, I'm new to this, really, this is like my first uh, um, 
live streaming thing that I've done on my own. Usually Dana would do the stuff and take care of the technical stuff. I'm really not technical. So as you see, I messed up all the formatting. I didn't know how it was done right. So, but I think it's gonna get recorded and I think it should be fine. And if not, I'm happy to provide these slides to whoever wants them. So, okay. And the next question here is, can rickettsia be chronic? I'm confused because three years into my symptoms, I'm testing negative now for Borrelia, but positive for rickettsia out of the sudden, all of a sudden. Can this somehow come to the surface? I didn't have any new infection. So we don't really have good evidence for chronic rickettsia once it's treated. We have good evidence for rickettsia untreated to be chronic. You know, they've discovered or whatever, they've recovered excuse me, rickettsial DNA from damaged heart valves, the people who didn't know they had rickettsial infection. But the stereotype for rickettsia is um, like Rocky Mountain spider fever. And you can take people from, you know, nearly death's door to getting fully better um, within two weeks. So rickettsia has this kind of stereotype responding very, very well to doxycycline. I'm not aware of uh, chronic rickettsia in people despite the treatment. And if there's any evidence, it's not going to be a lot of it. You know, there's um, there's so much evidence about chronic Lyme at this point. It's kind of ridiculous, and that's still being denied. Um, for people that don't know, there's about 75 uh, human cases already. And even up to two years of antibiotics, they've isolated the bacteria alive, despite how hard it is to grow. They did a study from the NIH where they put clean ticks that grew up, in, grew up in the laboratory not to have Lyme, and they put them on people with quote unquote post Lyme syndrome. And the ticks got, you know, some of the ticks got sick from the people with post Lyme syndrome. We're not curing it effectively in animal studies. They've done, you know, mouse studies and dog studies and horses and monkeys, and we're not curing it really with just the stuff that's recommended by IDSA and we're also not even killing it effectively in the test tube with those same antibiotics. So Lyme is really, really powerful data. Bartonella is very powerful data, even though Bartonella is considering emerging infectious disease. So there's not, it's not, it hasn't been studied for nearly as long as Lyme. It's already, you know, we have evidence of persistence despite months and months and months of antibiotics. And Bartonella is inherently more antimicrobial um, resistant. And so I know your question is about Kretzia. So the question is, why could it um, turn positive all of a sudden? You know, I'm not sure, you know, about the specific things. It's hard to say, but I could just tell you in general, let's say somebody has a blood test result and the cutoff is a one and someone has a 0.99 and then the lab just calls it negative and doesn't give a number. And then there's going to be variability in these tests over time. I don't know if anyone's ever had two blood tests ordered by this, like different doctors on the same day and the cholesterol is done twice or a white count done twice and it's reported because I've seen that a lot. And the white count will be different, you know, like 4.3 and 3.8 or the cholesterol will be different by 20 points. You know, like the, uh, the variability of the test itself with the exact same blood from the same patient at the same time is it's really, you know, it's considerable. So if somebody's on the fence of a of a positive result, like a high negative, it's it's not inconceivable to waver back to high negative and low positive. Anyway, just maybe that can help. I'm not sure. Um, so let's see here. What does this say? Thank you. We tried to see you. You will do a case study on her. Please message me if possible. Oh, okay. This is um. Well, yeah, like I said, anyone's uh, welcome to call the office. It's very limited on what I can do you know, on here. This is just for general information. Um, oh, no. I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. This is like, there's so many tragedies. I, um, it, it's, you know, like I said, my brother died at 59. I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, how does anybody retain a shred of sanity in this world? That's like the question that I always ask. The, the stresses that we all go through is just so, so horrific. Um, yeah, so again, it's the recurring theme. Um, so we both got sick in January 2020. Yeah, yeah, rhinovirus. Um, when I went to the doctor, she's like, you are 
she, she said, you're, you're sick. And she was sure the flu test would be positive. The flu test was negative. And she ended up giving me a uh, Zofluza anyway, because she's like, I can't not give you something. You're too sick. Even though I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's just a false negative flu test. Do you know that Zofluza actually had some activity against COVID in the test tube? They did one crappy study on it. And I say crappy because it's crappy, I think. It's, um, they did one study in humans because they, they gave it to people like an average of 10, uh, 12 weeks into the, no, excuse me, 12 days, something like that, into the illness. And, you know, it's past the viral replication time. Like if you take Tamiflu more than 48 hours, it doesn't work for flu. I don't, I don't see those flus are working for COVID 12 days into the illness. So they didn't really give it a fair shake. I always wanted that, that drug to be studied. And um, I just remember that's when my fever broke. But, um, okay, so it's about the hearing loss. And this is from Jason. Hi, Jason. When pressing a finger on stretch marks versus Bartonella, what's the difference in how they change color? So can you differentiate a stretch mark that's not from Bartonella versus a stretch mark that's from Bartonella? I don't see that. I don't think so. I really don't think that people can differentiate. I know people have, I've heard, a legend where people say they can differentiate. It's also speaking about the MS because it's the theme of today's talk. I hear doctors all the time telling me they can differentiate real MS from Lyme induced MS like things. And I was like, really? Considering Lyme can cause a clinically indistinguishable illness to MS, which has been published over and over and over again, how does anybody differentiate anything? So I'm, I'm very uh, reticent about when people make claims sometimes, but. Good question, Jason. And okay, you're welcome, Lisa. It's nice to see you. Thank you for the nice words. And let's see here. Before being properly, I couldn't get your question here. Let me pull this up. Before I was properly diagnosed, I had six lesions in the tick by I kept getting negative tests in the hospital. They misdiagnosed me for MS. They spread lesions to my head to my toes. Can that be fixed? It was damaged for life. So again, I can't speak to anybody's case. You know, I don't see people's records on here. And even if I did, I'm not legally allowed, but I can just, in general terms, if people with MS have atrophy of the spinal cord or what's called black holes in the brain, that's a sign of damage that can't be fixed with antibiotics, unfortunately. And that's what the patient who I said, who responded so beautifully, and she's such a nice lady too, um, that didn't come back because she was uh, trying to like, just put it like compartmentalize it, you know, put it in the put it away and not deal with her, the fact that it was coming back. Um, she has some, uh, you know, some, some damage. So once that type of damage occurs, we can't fix it with antibiotics. Before that, we can really get it under control. So I've had lots of patients who like, you know, we have, I have a lot of interviews that people have probably seen about patients who doctors told me not to try because there's nothing that could be done and this and that. But when I see a relapse or emitting MS patient who doesn't have permanent damage on their MRIs. I think it's really hopeful, not hopeless. I don't don't say I don't say the same thing about primary progressive. You know, some primary progressive MS patients have come in, we've gotten them to be a smidge better, but I tell them at the beginning, you know, I say, look, we're not out to just see patients. We actually turn a lot of patients away. And if somebody says, look, I understand that the the um, outcomes aren't great for this, but 15% is better than nothing. Can you help? We'll try, but we don't encourage people primary progressive to call the office, but um, the relapse are admitting we do. So um, so I don't know if there's a question. So can it refit damage? Like, so yeah, so just in general about damage, it depends on if there's atrophy. It depends on if there's black holes. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing your own sudden hearing loss. Sarah, yeah, it's, you know, I'm an open book when it comes to my illness. I don't care. You know, people at the beginning, when I first got into practice, um, I, everyone's like, you can't tell anybody that you had Lyme. They'll say that you're a patient advocate and not a real, you know, they'll say that you're biased. Well, I am biased. Everybody's biased. Every human is biased. It's so stupid. I mean, without our bias and our passions, whatever, if we're just robots, you know, we're not very good. If the trick is recognizing our bias. I mean, of course I'm biased about Lyme. I see the worst cases with chronically ill patients that come from all over the country. How could I not be biased and think it's a miserable illness? The people who are asymptomatic or the people that come with three weeks of, um, you know, illness and get better, they don't see me. However, I recognize that. 
it's these doctors, like I look back at that study about the response rates with the MS treatments, I get very nervous that there's a lot of bias that's not being recognized. It's so troubling to me. Um, so, hello, Jennifer. Is there a summary of these chronic Lyme studies with citations that we can view and share? Yes. So, oh, the summary of the chronic Lyme studies. You mean about the, um, the MS patients or the stuff that I talked about in uh, Zero Spin? All the references in Zero Spin are uh, clickable. The paywall will just keep it down for a while. Um, but uh, in terms of the chronic Lyme studies, you're talking about with um, the where they isolated the bacteria alive. Yeah, all that stuff's in the public domain right now. I did a, um, I was one of a handful of doctors that were asked to give a talk at um, the IDSA hearing in 2009. And that's on actually the link to all that stuff is on the website for my office. And it's, um, so there's a, a 20 minute video with lots and lots of references. There's an 81 page document, 226 medical references. And they asked me to write up all the documentation that um, was there for chronic Lyme being a chronic infection. So I started writing and I just didn't stop for six months. And I was doing it, you know, until one in the morning, every night after work, just writing this document and it just went on and on and on because there was so much data. And that was 2009. And there's a lot more data now. So it's almost, it's, it would almost be funny if it wasn't so serious and ridiculous, but um, there's a ton of data. So here we go here. Uh, CCI is an interesting and good question. So I do believe so. I've definitely seen cases of CCI that were not purely injurious. I have one case that was a definite injury. But um, even in her case, uh, the people get these, um, during Herxheimer reactions, the, the symptoms related to CCI exacerbate typically. And um, there's definitely an infectious or inflammatory component to it. So... And you say, can things like Bartonella, can it change the elasticity of ligaments and tendons? Well, absolutely, yes. I mean, I'm a walk, walking example of it. I was, you know, the poster boy for rheumatology. Um, everything got incredibly tight and then everything just fell apart. And um, all my joints, connected tissues, just it was a disaster. So it didn't happen in my neck for whatever reason. But what if it would have? It would have been CCI. It happened in all my joints. Oh boy, 45. I just, I'm so sorry. This is so terrible. Um, yeah, so I don't really have an opinion on uh, T Labs. I like Dr. Moziani quite a bit, but, you know, I, I'm not, uh, don't have access to their internal documents. So I don't know in terms of specific, you know, I really can't comment. Um, what tests do we use? So uh, I think Igenix is a good lab. They've been around for a long time. They've been picked on by a lot of doctors, and I think it's unfair. Um, you know, when you do this for a long time, you kind of want to, it's such a controversial field. You want to use labs that are kind of less, um, that are conservative reputation or whatever. And we typically have used, um, labs like Stony Brook in the past, but they changed their testing. We use a lot of medical diagnostics these days. We've used Galaxy. Believe it or not, we, um, I would say 98% of our labs are done at Quest and LabCorp. I know that's going to shock most people. We don't do many send outs. Um, and it's, uh, I just don't think that people have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. There's a remarkable amount of information that we can get from in-network labs. And I don't I don't know. It seems to be this pervasive. There's nothing against those labs that we're mentioning. They're, they're, I don't know, vibrant very well, but I think Igenix is fine. And, um, but we just don't, we don't use uh, labs that cost people an arm or leg because it's expensive to have medical care and we don't want to uh, make it more burdensome with, uh, with, um, with uh, tons and tons of lab expense. So it says here, I thought I had heard of brain lesions going away. Are you saying they are always permanent? No, they're not always permanent. And um, like I said before, in our treated MS patients, we would have a 50% radiographic improvement rate with lesions. And now I'm concerned. I didn't actually do the math because, um, you know, 
working on other things, but I'm concerned that it may be a little bit less now. We've seen a couple of troubling cases where people were getting better clinically, but the lesions progressed, and that was not a thing we'd seen before. So um, I'm concerned that COVID is COVID, or some of the interventions for COVID may have changed the landscape uh, in treating MS. And we're going to um, be winding up in a little bit, just because it's you know coming up at eight o'clock. We're just trying to do this for an hour, so. This is about stretch marks. So for everybody that doesn't know stretch marks, there's a lot of people who think that stretch marks should be the like a diagnostic, um, a diagnostic rash for Bartonella in the same way that, that Lyme rashes or migraines are diagnostic for Lyme. And okay, new regular from the upper arms. Three years after my first vision for the time. Yeah. So um yeah, so most of my patients that get stretch marks uh, are thin, and we do have some patients that are a little bit overweight, and some patients are a lot overweight, and you know sometimes you can't tell when people are morbidly obese, but it it does uh, strike me as being like annoying when doctors will tell my uh, really slim patients that they're overweight when they're not at all, and and again, who gets stretch marks in your arms? You know, unless your muscles are out to here or something, it's really hard to get stretch marks in your arms. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's really nice to say, I'm trying to be a good human, you know, every day we try. Um, oh, this is so nice. Thank you. Very, a lot of nice comments. Um, there was uh, one trolley person up there that I that said I was a bad person. I didn't, didn't bring didn't bring that comment forward. But um, but it's nice to see those people saying some nice things too. Um, so let's see here. What's this question? Sorry, yes. Where where they isolated live spirochetes? So what tissues did they isolate them from? They've isolated them from a variety of tissues. So they've even been isolated from the blood, as hard as that is to do. Um, but they've been isolated from spinal fluid, from um, the eye. They've been isolated. They've been isolated from heart valves. Like they had spontaneous blowing of the heart valve, which is heart valve just blew, and uh, they found spirochetes in there. You know, I think there's like so many iterations of a theme and um, I don't know. I mean, you know, my story is in chronic, but this part of my story, I never really even talk about on videos, but just about the heart valve thing. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I dragged my mom to the pediatrician. It was in the 1970s and he was a great guy. Somehow he lived to 90 years old. I looked him up because he was more of the obese. He smoked in the exam room, but um, I liked him a lot probably influenced by the fact that he gave me lollipops. But um, I went there because I had heart palpitations and I dragged my mom to the pediatrician at like five or six years old, which is like, what kid does that? And he told me I had gas bubbles. And I, I just was like, is this how it's going to be? Like no adult is ever right. So I just lived my life with heart palpitations. And I didn't really think much of them because, you know, you get used to everything in life. Right? But I was otherwise healthy. And when I was a teenager, they listened to my heart. They said, hey, this is really bad heart murmur. So I went to the cardiologist. Cardiologist was like, oh, you have an uh, echocardiogram. It's good news and bad news. The good news is it's mitral valve prolapse. It's super common. It's really, you know, it's not serious. The bad news is your case is actually very, very severe. You have a degenerated mitral valve. Don't worry about it now. But when you're 50, you'll probably need valve surgery. Don't worry about it now. You're like... 17 or 18 or whatever. So of course I freaked out, then try to live my life. Every year I had to get echocardiograms to make sure the valve was okay or was stable, whatever. And then I got Lyme in mid school and I had lots of cardiac symptoms from it and I got treated and I kept coming back, kept relapsing the Lyme. So I kept getting treated and treated over, you know, some years. And after those first three years of treatment of getting recurrent rounds of antibiotics, my heart valve, because it was checked once a year, got better and better and better. And then it went away and it healed completely. And I'm 58 and I've never needed heart valve surgery and my heart valve was fine. My mitral valve was, was okay. So what did I have when I was five years old? I had no idea. I'm not saying it was definitively Lyme. I'm not saying it wasn't. I was healthy apart from that. So like I said, there are many mild strains of these things. There are severe strains of these things, but that did happen to me. And I look back at it and I think there was something. It was something that was really affecting my heart valve and, you know, who knows what it would have done. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, oh, this is a nice question about CIDP. 
The answer is yes, but um, it's not a it's it's not an MS CIDP is even though it's demelanating, it's not really um, you know it's it's usually distinct from MS and um, I have seen uh, tons and tons of CIDP cases. CIDP cases. I see it more with Bartonella blue now than I do with Lyme. Even though Lyme can cause a demyelinating neuropathy, I, I do see it more with Bartonella historically. So CIDP stands for chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. It's a mouthful, and um, sometimes, sometimes it's associated with um, occult cancers, and sometimes it's not. And part of the thing that got worse after I got COVID in January 2020, I started getting numb patches in my legs. Numb. At first, they were really painful, and then they were numb. I went to my neurologist, good guy. You know, the thing is that these, it's good to have good people, you know, that you can see. But I know that they don't really have tools, like nothing in their toolbox, you know, to really help. And I went in, I was like, hey, I have this thing. It seems like it's CIDP. He's like, yeah, that's what it sounds like, blah, blah, blah. And because it can be associated with cancer, but I just was like, you know, just do your test, rule out cancer, and then I'm going to be done because I don't want to <laughs> do anything else. And I did, um, you know, have that develop after I uh, got sick. So it's one of those things. So, yes, CIDP um, it does seem to happen with vector-borne infections. Like I said, kind of happen with Lyme, probably. I do think, like I said, it's, it's more of a Bartonella thing from what I see. What is CCI for Lisa? It's cranial cervical, or is it cervical cranial? It's cranial cervical. I believe it's cranial cervical. Instability. So it's uh, an instability of the, the neck. I love and respect you, but I tell you, I was crushed when you did the book tour and wouldn't say Lyme. Why wouldn't I say Lyme? I get it. I, I also don't. I, we didn't even do a book tour. <laughs> <laughs> we just did, uh, it was a virtual book tour, Wendy, I'm sorry. So you could put another thing. Um, I, uh, whatchamacallit, I say Lyme a lot, you know, chronic Lyme, chronic Lyme, chronic Lyme, you know, so I'm not sure, but you can, if you tell me what it is, I'll try to do better. Um, the, uh, the, the book tour was, I wish we went on a book tour. It was, uh, because it was in the middle of COVID, we just basically did everything virtual kind of um kind of you know a letdown because we're really excited to go traveling and my big thing was going on dr oz in person that was like the big thing and new york city was completely desolate and dead it was so eerie when it was all locked down i remember going in there um okay so i guess that's it um i know there's a lot more questions which i definitely appreciate everybody participating here and i just want to say thank you for everybody it's great um Sorry for any technical things and whatever uh, hiccups I'm having with my first um, attempt here, but I'm sure I'll get more smooth as we go along. And I just want to wish everybody a good night. I wanted to show you this thing. I don't know how to share screens. This kid, I, I think it's probably not going to. I don't know how to do it. Because this makes me um, share it for at least a minute. I don't know how to do it, so I'm gonna just, I'll do it another time. There's, uh, if anybody looks at my Twitter stuff, there's this kid dancing that, uh, whenever I'm feeling like a little blah, I've been watching that, it's, it's hysterical. Um, he's like five years old or something. It's on the, you know, a few a few tweets down. Well, everyone, good night. Thank you so much for uh, your attention and spending time with me. It's my pleasure. And um, I'll do one on long COVID sometime, uh, sometime soon. Okay, take care, be well, and speak again soon, bye.